Financial Integrity When receiving and distributing financial gifts, every local church and parachurch ministry should entrust this responsibility to several trustworthy individuals. Here's Dr. Gene Getz. Paul zeroes in on this in uh, verses 20 24, chapter 8. He says, We're taking this precaution so no one can find fault with us concerning this large sum administered by us. In other words, there was a lot of money that was collected. We don't know how much, and it's amazing uh, how they must have transported that money in bags. And uh, when they arrived in Jerusalem, there was a whole bunch of men that arrived with these bags of money, coins, and I don't know what other uh, currency that they would have had. Uh, but Paul knew this was a large sum of money, and he wanted to be above reproach. He says, For we're making provision for what is honorable. We don't want to be uh, give any, any basis for criticism to dishonor the Lord because we're not faithful. We want to be honorable not only before the Lord, but before men. We want to demonstrate financial integrity. We have also sent with them our brother, whom we have often tested in many circumstances. He's found diligent, and I've been more diligent because of his great confidence in you. As for Titus, you already know about his integrity. He is my partner. He's my co-worker serving you. As for our, our brothers, there was more than one. They are the messengers of the church, the glory of Christ. Therefore, before the churches, show them the proof of your love and of your boasting about, our boasting about you. In other words, what he's simply saying is, uh, I'm sending other people. Uh, Paul never, as far as we know, never handled money alone. In fact, one of the criticisms of him was he wouldn't even receive what was due him because he didn't want to be a bad example. Uh, he, he knew that he needed to be above reproach in this area. Uh, it's not a good idea for those of us in ministry, and particularly those of us who live of the ministry and are supported in the ministry, not to handle money. It's very important that we not, that we have others that we can trust who will be responsible. But they must be responsible individuals. Uh, I tell a funny story about that. Some of you have heard this funny story as to why you shouldn't trust the preacher, and it relates to me. And it was back when we started the church in the warehouse, and Jim Harris, one of our elders, had somehow, he ended up with the money that, <laughs> that night, and he said, Gene, the counters and whatever, they're gone, and what do I do with this money? He said, why don't you take it? And I foolishly said, okay, I'll take it. And I took it home, and lo and behold, it disappeared. It was totally, it was gone. I didn't know what in the world we did with that money. We had to write letters to everybody in the church and said, if you attended Friday night church and you made out a check, cancel it, because the money you gave has disappeared, and somehow I lost it. Well, I think, what was it, about six months later or so, honey, we found it in the hall tree at our house. In other words, when I, and then I remembered, yeah, when I came in that night, I said, boy, if somebody breaks in, I don't want them to find this. So I put it in the hall tree, forgot that I put it there, and that's one reason why you shouldn't trust the preacher. <laughs> then I had to get up and confess to everybody. The money was there, thank God, the money was there. But uh, enough of that. Uh, reflection response question. How did Paul apply this principle in the appointment of local church elders, overseers, deacons? Well, it's very clear from the qualifications. For example, 1 Timothy 3, verse 8. Not addicted to wine, not a bully, not gen but gentle, not quarrelsome, not greedy. You know, don't get people in spiritual leadership who are greedy. You can't trust them. Uh, deacons, likewise, should be worthy of respect, not hypocritical, not drinking a lot of wine, not greedy for money. If they are, you can't trust them. You can't trust them with money. An overseer as God's manager must be blameless, he wrote to Titus. Not arrogant, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not a bully, not greedy for money. He really underscores that. And then by negative example, uh, we read uh, this in Titus. He says, there are also many rebellious people, idle talkers, deceivers, especially those from Judaism, and this almost sounds like the false apostles. It is necessary to silence them. They overthrow whole households by teaching for 
dishonest gain what they should not. And I would assume that that was one of the issues in Corinth, that they were teaching these people false doctrine for dishonest gain, and the Corinthians had bought into it. And uh, that was really sad. And one of the things that we need to understand in the Roman Empire, that traveling teachers were expected to receive monies, and if they didn't, they didn't respect them. It was part of their culture. There has to be something wrong with you if you teach and you don't receive something for it. And they were criticizing Paul because he came to Corinth and he wouldn't take anything. So they turned his integrity against him. And that was one of the things that Paul was defending, obviously, in this situation. Financial integrity. Very, very important. And Paul was devoted to that. 